in our reading from Jeremiah today, we listen as Jeremiah tells the people of Israel, who now reside in exile, not to lose hope. God has not abandoned them, and this hardship they endure will not last forever. God will turn their sorrow to joy, and God will once again live in their midst. I am sure that that encouragement was received then as many receive such words of hope today. Okay, but when? Jeremiah never gives a timeline. His response, which is what many clergy say today, is in God's time, not ours. That was and still is something very difficult to hear. Like then, we don't want to wait on God to act. We want what we want, and we, when we want it, we want our relief now. From whatever it is that troubles us, not later. But Jeremiah remains steadfast in his message. Relief, he says, will come. And when it does, the joy it brings will be so great that what we have endured will become a memory of the past. And all that will matter will be the joy that fills us beyond all measure. In the meantime, we, like the people that Jeremiah wrote to, will journey along the path that is before us. However, unlike them, we have the assurance that we do not make that journey alone. Our Lord is with us. Always. Holding us up when we need support. Lifting us up when we fall. And pointing us in the right direction. When our grief, our sorrow, blinds us from seeing where such relief is. I know when we're hurting. We often believe that if God loves us, then relief should not be something we journey towards. It should come to us. I saw a meme on Facebook the other day. It showed the people of Israel walking through the of the Red Sea. And the citation, the caption read, God does not always remove what we must travel through. It does make it possible for us to do so. Yes. Journey to know the relief we long for. But as Paul makes clear in his letter to the Ephesians, if we have the eyes to see it, that relief has already come. It did come as we hoped. And it fills us with a joy that while not removing, erasing our worries, gives us the strength and encouragement we need to, to keep moving toward which God hopes us to find. The place where our joy is made complete. Paul, of course, is talking about Jesus. And the joy Jesus brings us, he says, is found in our new relationship with God. We are no longer simply God's chosen people. We have become God's own. Children not of the flesh, but of the Spirit. Adopted through the sacrifice Jesus has made for us and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit who, like Jesus, was with God and was of God from the very beginning. And who now dwells within us to the very end of time. Paul's implication throughout his letters is that this is the greatest of all joys that we can know in this life because it means that no matter what happens along the way, we are never in fear of losing what has been given to us, that which binds us one to another and with God. Love. 
Love revealed to us in and through Jesus. Love that surpasses all understanding. Love that assures us that that's, there's, this is not all there is in life. There, there is more awaiting us at our journey's end. Unlike those Paul wrote to, we don't need to be convinced that this love is real. Or that God loved us so much that through the incarnation we celebrated at Christmas, that love came among us to show us the way back into right relationship with God and with one another. We know it is real because we have the witness of those who have known it and seen it. And we have experienced it in and through those God has placed in our lives to share it with us. Some of those witnesses are the wise men we hear about in today's gospel. Believed to have been early astronomers, they saw something in the heavens that to them was a sign of the birth of a new king. A king who would be different than all the others. Not one of human making, but of divine agency. So they did what one might expect. They traveled to see for themselves this new king. Where did they believe the sign was leading them? To the palace, of course. Where else would one go to look for a king? And arriving, they do not find what it is they were looking for. Instead, they find a jealous king who wants nothing to do with his potential replacement. They had misinterpreted signs. Sent on their way, they see again and continue to follow the sign that was given. This time, instead of following their own tuition, they follow God and come across something amazing. A child. Not adorned in royal niceties, but living amongst the people. Could this really be the new king? It had to be. It was to this child the sign had led them. And to this child, they would offer their gifts. Then returning to their homeland, knowing that the child they encountered was indeed someone special. Unlike all the kings before him, this one, this one would rise up from within their midst and lead the people to greatness. The rest, as they say, history. Jesus will grow in stature and prominence. And he will lead his people and all the people of the earth towards a greatness unlike any other. God. God's love for them and for us. Through him, a gate will be opened for all to enter to the place where one's long-awaited relief is made known. The incarnation we celebrated at Christmas was the sign given that points towards and is now the light that shines upon the gate before us. And the upcoming season of Epiphany is our journey towards that gate. A journey towards which we are encouraged to keep moving to what God wants us to find instead of, like the wise men, trusting in our own beliefs of what should be. The journey is not going to be easy. Even Jesus must travel through some tough times. But the resurrection is the sign that God has given, that that gate has been thrust open, inviting all to enter, continuing their journey to where joy will one day be made complete.
When will that day be? Only God knows. But until that day comes, our faith in the promises that God has made, both in the time of Jeremiah and in the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we are reminded that whatever it is that we endure, whatever causes us sorrow in this life, it will not last forever. And one day we will reside with God in a place where sorrow and pain are no more. Only life everlasting. And not because of anything we have done. But simply because we are loved. Loved so much that God came among us in human form to show that love to us that we might embrace it as it embraces us. Amen.